Hey fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. Today I'm here with Thomas Alm, another Swede, Swedish coach. He has been coaching for like 30 years. Uh, lots of experience coaching players on ATP, WTA, and uh, lots of coaching experience also when it comes to the nutrition and health. So we'll get into all kinds of things in this podcast. Uh, so welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Great. So, uh, so what's happening in your life right now? You're in Stockholm at the moment. I am. I I, um, I went here in January um, to 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 be here with my dad, uh, take care of him a little bit, and uh, help him with some training. He, he's was doing a little bit better, and uh, yeah, so he's better now. And so I've been doing some some shorter jobs. I was a couple of weeks coaching one guy in in Sharm El Sheikh tennis. I went for a marathon with a I, I run, and so I did a marathon with a woman who wanted to run sub four in wow. Malta, your old uh, neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. And Going so, there in a week. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so did that, the 358 something. And yeah, doing smaller things and I'm looking for different jobs. But uh, with, with where I am in my life right now, I told myself I want, for the first time, I don't want to just jump into something. I'm going to really, really find something that 100% inspires me. So I've said no to a lot of things since January. But uh, yeah, there, I have some that I'm talking to and I have a video call later today and we'll see. Yeah, I think that's sensible, I guess, sometimes to have that break because it's very easy in life, you know how it is when you, even if you change like a normal desk job or whatever, you always have something around the corner, that's why you change and you don't have the time for yourself to actually figure out, is this what I want to put my whole heart and soul into, right? Yeah, yeah. but but also, you know, it, for me, I'm, I'm a very, you know, a talkative person and I'm very, um, I have a lot of energy. So since I'm so energetic, I, I go all in on every, anything I do, but... It has been usually you go and then you say, okay, what are the kind of uh, what are the circumstances and, and what can we do? And like I, I try to say, okay, I want this. I want us to be able to have. If I have a player, I want them to have a budget to travel. Uh, I'm, I tell them what I stand for in my coaching and how I want things. And I think now I'm more because I really I, I've I've been on all levels now. And it's been going well. I for me, I think you know. And I I'm thinking now that I want something that I really that I'm inspired by, but I, that everything has to be right. I don't want to jump into something. And then after the two, three months, it turns out that, no, this is, you know, we're, we're backing on this or we're doing that. So I'm going to be very clear this time uh, before I jump into something and, and uh, really get all the parameters the way that I want them. Um, the, the, what, the way I feel that I can help someone the best and the way they can, you know, I feel that they can really become good tennis players. So yeah, I'm not going to stress. That's probably smart. Uh, how important is the personal chemistry when you are coaching a, a player and you're focusing on one player? Like that must be very important. Well, well, to be honest, uh, yes, of course, you know, but, but I haven't, for me, I have, I still haven't had anyone that I tried out on the court with who didn't say that they wanted to keep working with me. But I think not because that I'm amazing, but I think that has a lot to do with that. You can kind of weed out who, who is not, you know, not that there's anything wrong with them, but that we are different. And so I feel like, okay, this is not going to work out. Like if you, if you're way too politically correct, I mean, I'm going to say something at some point that it's not going to work. So, so you kind of, those kind of things, I kind of feel right away because I'm the kind of guy, you can say anything to me and I don't, I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, that's fine. And, and, and a lot of people are not like that. So a lot of those people, you know, they, you, you kind of weed them out early <laughs> and some people, yeah, it takes longer, but, um, yeah, I, I think the chemistry is, and especially with the women's side, I feel they, they go a lot by chemistry and I've seen that on the higher level, super good players. They have coaches and you're like, what is this? You know, like, why is this guy a coach even? Is he a coach? But it's hard for them to know who is a good coach. If they have rackets and nice clothes and, and, and shoes and they play themselves and they say, I'm a coach and they have a good chemistry socially, then they like them. And then that, that's the coach. Um, so yeah, for, for, especially on the women's side, I think it's tremendously huge thing. If you, you as a guy, if you, you know, if you say, okay, Thomas is going to make you top hundred and you go, oh, I can't stand that guy, but if he's going to make me top hundred, I'll go for it and I'll do what he says. Whereas a woman will be like, you know, they rather not take you <laughs> unless they really like you. It's more important for them. That, that's, that's what I think at least from my, my experience. Yeah, more emotional connection than than like just results focused, like really being diligent on, yes. on like the goals and stuff like that. 
Uh, and and you write that also in your profile, like it's all about being all in. Like it, that's kind of the, the the spirit you want from the player. Like there's no compromise here in, in trying to get to their goals. Yeah, and I think this is this is something I've gotten I've gotten a lot of, lot of flack for this over the years because I I usually tend to say what I think, and I don't care. You know, I don't like this argument from authority. If I'm speaking to, I mean, if I'm sitting with Brad Gilbert, who is one of the best coaches ever. I'm, I'm of course going to listen to him, but if he says something that doesn't make sense, I will oppose that. You know, like he's not going to have all the answers, obviously, but I, I feel there's a lot of, okay, this person has been a good player. This person has had a lot of success as a coach. So they are right just because, you know, and I, I don't really agree with that. I think that even if you are a great coach, you should, you should, you know, you have a lot of results or you've been a great player. You should be able to come up with an argument and, and, I don't have a problem with being 50 people in the room and I think the, the opposite way, I'm going to say what I think. And if they say something that makes sense to me, you know, I'm going to change my opinion. You know, like that's why I'm more into science than, than religion, I guess, you know, because it changes all the time, you know, and when I have other facts come in, okay, okay. Then I say, okay, I'm, I'm, I was wrong. And if I have to say sorry, then I will, but I will change my opinion. And, and I think one thing that I know that I've gotten that people don't like to hear, at least in Sweden, and, and I mean, Sweden hasn't done that well in the last years. And then the two, two of the three best players, I mean, I would say to be, to be fair, two of the three really good players that we've had in the last years uh, are now out. Mikkel Imer is on uh, missing the doping test and, and uh, Dragos Madras uh, a few days ago was suspended for four, four years and six months for some betting thing, whatever. Uh, and so we're not doing that well. And what I think is that for women's tennis, especially, um, what I see from the they, they, the players that become good from other countries that become really good, they have a coach. The coach is with them like 50 weeks per year. They are there all the time. They do tennis and it's extremely intense. They, they practice a lot and they're extremely intense. Whereas in Sweden, it's like, okay, okay, Jonas, you are the, you are the head coach of this person and you're with them for like eight weeks per year for tournaments. And then you coach them at home. And then all the other coach at the club, he does a couple of weeks. And then they have this guy who is a, or, or, or woman who is a, kind of a child coach some weeks. And then the father is there some weeks. And that's a problem, I think. We, and I understand that, you know, there's, there's a budget for a, a club or for an academy. But I think this is something that they don't want. Like, it's, it feels like people don't want to talk about this. And I think this is a, this is a major, major thing that, that we're not doing in Sweden. And others do. And that's something we have to change. Why do you think that is? Is like some kind of cultural thing, or is like because I mean I I do agree that the yeah. continuity. If you're working with someone, uh, and you see how important that is for like Alcaraz, for example, like he he yeah. needs to see Ferrero there almost, you know, otherwise he feels something yeah. is missing and he's playing quite quite subpar. And the continuity is so important. Is it like a budget thing? Like um, they don't want to invest money in it, or is the don't they see the reason that it's so important? Or what do you think that is that we're we're not seeing that? <laughs> Sorry, I I think it's tw two things. I think it's one is definitely an economical thing i mean if you have a player you know if you have an academy let's say that you and i have we have an academy and uh we have good players and then we say we have someone who is top 100 itf juniors we have a couple of players and you and i go with them to to the french open uh it's not it's, it's not easy but it's not that hard to get them there if you have some resources and then you you put some you know pictures we're at the french open and that's that's kind of a good good uh window for people to see that oh they have people at the french open and, you know, we get some new customers because of this. And I understand it's a business and we would probably do that. But then let's say that that person, if they're not the next, uh, you know, Mira Andreva or whatever, they're, you know, um, and they're coming up, if we want to make that player a Grand Slam player, even uh, for qualities to be like 230 in the world, and we want to make sure of that, well, then you and I have said, okay, what are we going to do now? We're going to have a meeting and say, okay, we're going to have to put this girl 49 weeks per year with a coach, going to tournaments, doing this, bam, bam, bam. And if we get there, which is not certain at all, it's much easier or less tough to get someone to the juniors. Well, what do we get? Like how much, is, is the juice worth the squeeze, essentially? And I think this is, this is a, obviously it's an economical thing. They can just throw, do this. I mean, the resources are, <laughs> are not unlimited. So I think that's one thing. Another thing I, I feel is we don't have that many players in Sweden. And I think a lot of coaches, if I feel that they want to, they want to have a good player, they know that they have, you know, they want to be at their club. And let's say that you're making 60, 70 K a month working at a club as a, as a director of the club or head coach. 
and you have that place some weeks, you go within some weeks, you coach them at home, you are the you know, responsible coach, so to speak, but you're sharing it with others, then you can still keep your job and you still have a highly, quite highly ranked player that you are the coach of. You can go down to Bolstad, to the 125 WTA, and you can sit there and it's, it's a nice thing. But, you know, if, if the, what, is the, what is the option? Well, the option is to quit your job, maybe make like 1500 bucks, the, the, the family is paying you, you take a year off from your job or something and they can fire you within a second, you know, from one day to the next. It's tough. So, but I, but I think, you know, I don't really know how to get around that with the economical part. Uh, but I think also a lot of coaches, they, I feel they do this because if the player does reasonably well, they can say like, oh, look, my player is doing well. If they're not doing well, it's like, well, you know, unfortunately I cannot have them all the time, you know? So they don't get, you know, it's, it's a good, you know, benefit versus risk analysis. So I think it's a combination, but the economical part is, is obviously big, but I think the, the bad part is that nobody wants to really talk about it. You know, they say, oh, no, no, that's not needed. You know, you can have one who is responsible, but then you have the, these two, three guys helping or whatever. And I don't believe in that because I, I've seen so many players. I've been doing this for like 26 years now. I've been to, I, I counted like 193 or something international tournaments. I've seen like Jacob uh, that you know, that you've hit with, that I coached before. He beat Bublik in his last junior tournament final. He beat Rusevori like five years ago. He had a tight match with uh, David Vitrukina. He, he trained with, with uh, what the, the crazy lefty French guy. What's his name? Motet. Motet. And I mean, I've seen them. You know, I saw the Pliskovas when they were small growing up. I've seen a lot of the players. And it's, you know, and I talk to everyone. And I ask questions and I talk to parents. I talk to coaches. And you hear how they've been training. I talk to Tony Nadal about Rafael, how he coached him, how, how much he played when he was a kid. And it's quite clear what they do. And I don't feel that we do the same thing in Sweden. And we're yeah. not even talking about it. No, I, I think Swedish tennis is in uh, kind of at the lowest point probably it's ever been. Uh, or not maybe ever, but at least like we had the glory days in the 90s. Then we uh, that ran over into the ni- 2000s. And we had Robin, you know, the last kind of big player. Uh, but right now it's in the, the really like the basement of uh, of tennis. Why do you think that is it's like it's like a what happened in Swedish tennis from the 80s 90s success story to to where we are today what what do you think what what's your opinion about this Well well it's funny you know because I mean the sport was obviously smaller before and uh, there wasn't that many other things like you played tennis and and since we had stars more like the up and coming kids they they tried out tennis but also it's interesting because we had players coming and there was Thomas Johansson and Jonas Björkman they were up there Johansson won the last, obviously, Grand Slam player, the last player to win a Grand Slam from Sweden in the Australian Open uh, in the early 2000s. And, and then Robin came up. But when we had Robin was before the Umer brothers came up. So if we would take away Robin, we were pretty bad, you know? Yeah. And we did good in Davis Cup because sometimes uh, Pim Pim, uh, Joachim Johansson would ha- make a comeback or Vinci Guerra, they could play like one match. But basically, we had Robin to win his singles. And then he and, you know, Lindstedt or Aspelin would win the doubles. So we could actually do good in, in Davis Cup. But and nobody was talking about that Swedish tennis is crap because it was bad. It was really bad. And then he quit. And everyone was like, holy Toledo, you know, we don't have anyone. What is this? And I'm like, it's been like this for like five years. It's just that we had Robin, so nobody was talking about it. And that's when they hired the Swedish, uh, you know, uh, Fredrik Grossingren, Fide, yep. uh, as, a, as a Davis Cup coach but also to have, you know, help the up and coming players, but they were a bit too old at the time. You know, he should have gotten them like three, four or five years before, I think. And he was doing a good job with what he did. We've won a lot of futures and like this more than like, it was good, but it was, you know, too little too late. And since then we haven't really recovered, I think. But in most, uh, you know, USTA, they, the USTA in America, they had a push before they did well. Uh, Italian tennis has done well. They have a lot of tournaments and they've been, you know, they have this, uh, yeah, quite, I think they, they are, the federation is quite, uh, you know, tough on like how you have to do things. They're controlling everything and they've been doing a good thing there. But we didn't really do anything. You know, we just thought that we were going to have players and then we didn't. But I think most most countries, they actually do it themselves. Like if you have a kid, yeah, you're going you're gonna to do it yourself. And you're going to make sure that they have everything. And who's going to care more about your kid than you? <laughs> no one. And yeah, we, we haven't we haven't had that. And in Sweden, it's for some reason it's it's not. I wouldn't say that it's totally wrong to 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 practice hard, but it's always this. 
I'm out, and I've said this many times and nobody still listens to it, but I go out and I ask people, and they go, like, oh, this is how hard we train. We do this and that. You know, we're always, the ratio is one coach with one player or one coach with a player that is sparring with one other player. That's it. No groups, no nothing. They're doing this. And, and they'd say how much they train. And then they ask me, how, much, how do you train in Sweden? And I say, well, most players train like this. And they go like, oh, come on, why are you lying? This is not possible. Like, this is not, you know. And then I come to Sweden and I say what they say. Ah, oh, but Thomas, that's just them. You know, it's, that's too much. No, no, no. They're lying. So I'm like, what? Like, nobody, is, nobody believes me. So I don't think that it's like, but I've had this all the years that I've been playing. I had one player that was actually, oh, well, maybe two, but one player, one player, one girl that she, she practiced hard. She did, she was tough. But other than her, it's always, I say, let's do this. They say, well, you know, I don't think we need to do that. I think we should do this instead. And it's not that we're saying, okay, I think that you should run around your back and to play a forehand. And she thinks another thing. It's like, they want to do something that is less tough than what I say. You know, it's always that. And those are the players that, that don't become good. The ones that become good, in my experience, are the ones where I have to kind of, okay, this is enough. You know, you're resting. And uh, we don't have that that much, you know. And uh, since we don't have the one-on-one -on -one ratio, I don't know. That's what's needed. Look at William Reichman in Shigura now. He's had his dad who, who knows tennis. He's a good guy, Robert. And he's had him. And he's been his private coach for, you know, he didn't really rely on any club, even though he was the Malmö Teko and then a fair play, but it wasn't up to them. It was Robert. And he's doing well. And uh, yeah, Rebecca Peterson with her, her dad, the Uno brothers with their dad. And they, they've had help, but he's been there like the whole time. And we don't really do that in Sweden. That's That's my... For some reason, yeah, yeah, it could be cultural. Like, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I, growing up in Sweden, you know that the word logom is that's very strong in the the whole foundation where you don't do too much, don't do you know not enough, but like everything should yeah. be very balanced, you know. And then professional sports is not balanced; it's about taking it to the max and then maybe stepping back yeah. a little bit so you don't break you down in terms of injury and stuff. So I think the Swedish way there might be not enough in terms of tennis being such a competitive, individual kind of cost focused sport is such an expensive sport as well like but but it, you know Swedish yeah. people generally have some money so that shouldn't be the biggest issue uh, they shouldn't but I don't know it, it is and uh, I think it's something we have to turn around but I think the first thing we have to do is talk about it and you have to be able to say okay let's all you know come to the consensus that this is what we need and now what can we do to get there not say no you know that's not the Swedish way we that's how they do in Russia that's how what they do in Serbia but we have to find our way and our way is always lesser, you know, it's always nicer. It's long gone, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not, that's why people get injured a lot of times when they are at their best because they've been training so hard. So you're just at the cusp of being injured. And if you go over that line, you're injured, you know, so that's why it's in many sports, people get injured when they're at their top um, because it's tough and, and you have to push yourself because when, once you get close to the top, it's like a percentage here or there. That's why you see over the years, you see Rafa and Roger and, and, and uh, Nola do these kind of things, you know, when they do some strange thing on a balance ball or they, they're throwing something. What are they doing? Well, they're trying to get that last, you know, tenth of a percentage to beat the other two, you know. So once you, the higher you get, the, 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 the smaller the margins are. Uh, and so you have to be close to that. I mean, it's, you know, that's the way it is. It's, yeah, it's not it's... healthy to be a, an elite athlete, of course. Yeah, it's just physics, really. But what, you've been traveling around now, like on the pro tour, uh, and what what do you think about professional tennis? Like, do we need to reform the system? I mean, the money is not quite there. Is something we usually talk about here on the podcast, and people complain, and it's it's a tough grind to be a pro player not within top fifty. You know, it seems like. What's what's your feeling around that? Like, and how is it from the coach's side? I think that I mean, as a coach, what I see is the toughest thing. Like I said, uh, I'm I'm trying to to find something that really inspires me at the moment. I'll go all in on anything. I don't really care that much about salary because I don't have to. I, I have, you know, I'm doing fine. So I don't really have to work. I can do what I want. So it's either you can get a junior. And many times they are, you know, they have money, but they, they're not, you know, they're not going to go that high. But, you know, you can feel, you can have a good job if you want to make money. Or you get someone who's top 100. You can get some decent money. You can go on the tour or whatever. But then you have the players who are maybe 300 to 1,000. And there are some there between those 700 spots that actually could really become good. And they, but they don't usually have the money, you know? 
So if you want that, you know, it, it, that, that's the tough part. Like if I could have someone there and they had a sponsor and we could just go for it, they can also do well. But on the other hand, like many of them, you know, as you said, with the money, like if you're playing 15 Ks, uh, yeah, unless you win every week, you're going to lose money basically, unless you take a title every week. So, but I think, you know, if you're 27 years old and you're six, 700 in the world, that's your career high. I mean, I'm sorry, either you've done, you know, you, you, there's something that you can see, oh, you know, what the hell, why haven't you done that? And you can just change it right away. But if you're not, if you're not over the, like higher than that in the rankings at that point, like, I mean, you're not good enough to be fair, at least on the, I mean, on both sides, but especially like I've seen on the women's side, if you're, if you're not a really young player coming up, if you're like mid to late twenties and you are five, 600 in the world, and you've been there and you know you can't really break through that all the stuff you are gonna really make it it's like slim to none and slim just left town <laughs> you know yeah. it's not gonna happen so i think the money is not the problem because if you are good when i was with i was with the latvian girl and she was 1200 in the world and she came to me as like a last resort that's usually how i get players i've always had players that they get for some reason they come to me as a last resort every player i've had has come to me like okay there's nothing more to do and either they, they, they look me up or they just, like, she has fell, you know, into my club, basically, because she knew someone also from Latvia. She was 1,200 and she was slicing her forearm all the time. And she was like, okay, this is going to be my last try. And, and she just did anything I said on the court, like, everything that I said. It was like having a personal robot. It was amazing. I mean, amazing. And she won 167 matches in 15 months. Um, she took uh, 15 titles, pro titles, singles, and uh, went to 271 in the world before we quit. And I think, you know, like, because she won so much that that's all the money we had. She had no money from parents, no money from sponsors. She had worked a little bit as a coach during the lock, lockdown. She was in Dubai with her boyfriend, uh, his family, and she worked a little bit as a coach. She had a little bit of cash, but not much. But she won everything. and She just went up. And then it's not a problem. She's like 110 now. So, but, but if you, you know, if, if you're many years, you know, grinding on the 15Ks, if you're over 25 and you've been grinding there for many years, like it's okay, then, you know, you're not good enough. I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't think the money, I don't think they should make more money at that level. I really don't. I mean, if you can't, it's the, the level is not that high. You know, if you can't, if you can't beat a woman who is 700 in the world, you're like, I mean, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you know, we're not all good at everything. Maybe you are good at something else. Yeah. yeah. Be, no, but tennis is a tough sport. Like, I mean, it's like individual sport and, there are many ranked players, but only like a certain slim line of the rankings get money, you know, and that, that's, that's yeah. not it is. Like pretty harsh. But you also have to have like a pretty strong look in the mirror, I guess. And that helps us. Yeah. Is that what you can bring as a coach as well? Like that's the importance of having a coach is that they partly help you with your game, but they can also give you a little bit of truth serum or like understand where you yeah. are in your situation at the moment. Yeah, but it's also hard because you can't say, okay, well, maybe you could reach 300 if everything mm -hmm. falls into place because then yeah. you're going to quit. So you have to give them that kind of a dream, you know, to keep that dream. But I think, you know, many people say like when it was, because when I started the 15K was 10K, you know, you had $10,000 as price money. Now it's 15K, but they were like, oh, we should, we should, you know, hire the, the price money and whatever. And that's fine and all. But let's say that you made a million instead of 15K. Yes, that would be great right now for the players. But in 20 years, if it was that much money, the, the competition would be much higher. The reason that the competition isn't that high is because it's not that much money. If you're not passionate about tennis or if you have the sometimes most of the time a delusion that you're going to be a top 100 player when everything falls into place, I mean, the, 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 it's, the level is not, it's, it's, it's just not that high. And so I think that, um, you know, if the money was much higher and you were at the level where you are now when you're 800 in the world, you wouldn't even have a ranking. You know, it's like, it's, uh, yeah. So I, I don't think that necessarily they should make more money at this level. I don't know. I, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's, you should get out of there or you should do something else. That's just the way it is. Yeah. No, it sounds, sounds sensible as, a, and as an approach. Uh, when it comes to your coaching, like you're quite a physical minded guy. Like you do, uh, you know, running, you talked about marathons before, obstacle course stuff, weight and uh, muscles building and, and things like that. How important is physical versus mental, and what is kind of your strength as a coach to bring to the player? Well, I think it's I think it's connected. So, what I do is, I mean, first of all, you you have to be an animal, 
you have to go out there to kill and you you have to have a mindset like if you really want to make it you should have a mindset that for instance let's say that you're a girl that you're playing tennis and you say oh i can only be out for three weeks because i have to you know after that i have to go home to see my boyfriend well i don't want to coach you you know but if we're out for whatever weeks and then when we are home when you have the day off you hang out with your boyfriend that's not a problem you see the difference so the difference is like i have to or i'm doing it when i have time off that is the big difference that's number one and the second is that once you decided that this is what you want to do you have to be an animal you are not like i tell the player like you are not tired you're not tired like great players i mean i saw this thing on instagram it's true great players don't get tired just play you know if you want to be good you know i'm not here to 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 kind of you know i'm not going to lie to you you know you have to just shut up and play you cannot be tired until i tell you you're tired because i can see this I'm, I've, I've worked as a personal trainer for many years i've worked with tennis for so long and i can tell like if i even if i have you and i've seen a little bit like some shots you hit and you can play tennis and if i take you um at, at your age at your level i can take you out on the court and we can work for four hours in a day and i can push you to very close to the limit that you have with your level and with your physical level everything i will see when you're tired but your brain will tell you that you're tired long before your body will tell you and i can see that so you cannot get tired that's it and and the physical part creates the mental part if you are I mean, if you're strong physically, you're going to be strong mentally. So it's just, you know, and, and also I think for me, I always have, I hear this, oh, we should trust the process. Oh, I'm doing my best every day. And sure, of course, you're trying to do your best every day. Of course, you trust in the process. Otherwise, you will switch coach or, or, or switch a process. But we're here to win. You know, you're there to win. And it goes down with women's tennis. It goes down to like 14, 15 years old, because that's when you have to start. You know, you should be close to winning matches at the pro level because the physical side of things are not you know as far away as for the guys you have to know that you're playing tennis to win you're not playing there to to do your best or trust the process or something you're there to win yes we have a you know a, 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 as a coach i have a picture of look this is how i see you right now this is how they see the players in x amount of years this is how i see them develop but then we go to a match and i see okay when you're hitting your serve there and you're hitting your plus one over there you know, you don't win much when you're hitting your first shot there and your second shot there, you win a lot. Okay, let's do this. And then we go by that. And then, you know, we do a little bit according to the, the opponent. But I think it's very important to understand this. And I have a lot of energy uh, and I, I bring that to the, the players. And I say, listen, if we're going to work together, we have to have a lot of energy. We have to work hard and we have to understand that we're not going there. We're not going to monastery to stay at the resort and then sit in the lobby and play Uno with the other players and have like, you know, it's not like the office Christmas party because they're your competition. You know, I talk to the other coaches. I go to see the practices and I ask them, oh, why are you doing this? What is this exercise for? How are you thinking about this? And I pick their brains because I want to learn, but I'm not going to sit there like a social call and having coffee with them because I feel like, oh, you know, tales of the tour. I don't give a hoot about that because I want to win and they're the competition. And you shouldn't be not nice to people but you have to understand that you know you're there to destroy them you're not to be their friend and when i was with this locker room girl she was like that she was there to kill the other person like th that was it she was tough you know tough, and she's still she's tough as nails and uh, that's it that was the only thing she cared about and whatever you know and she was courteous and nice you know like this but then she went and did her thing and i think that's the most important thing that's what i tried to to get across to the player and uh yeah that's why when i had clubs in sweden we did really well that's why i sent players to college i don't know if anyone has better record than i do to be fair and uh you know with the academics they've done with the results they've had in college and i think the, the players that i've had pro players i've had now all the girls have done great things that I, i'm not sure that at least two of them will ever do something as great again but it's tough and you can tell now, and everyone who listens to this, um, they can tell that I'm an intense guy. I talk a lot and I know that. So I try to like, go away and I go running for two or three hours to leave the player alone sometimes and to rest their ears. But you have to have intensity and you have to love it. And you have to, you have to show up to work hard and go to battle every day. And then say, oh, but you know, it's not important winning. Or... Yes, it is. It's important. Winning or losing is what we're, we're playing to win, you know? you know it's it's that's just the way it is and i think we have to be honest with that like this is what we're doing 
not in a pressure like, oh, Jonas, if you don't win, you know, you're worth less. But if you don't win, I'm looking myself in the mirror and saying, okay, he didn't win. What happened? Well, they put a lot of, you know, high balls with spin to his backhand and he couldn't get around. What are we doing? How do we fix this? This mm -hmm. is not going to happen again. No. We'll look at it and then we work hard. And if we have to stand there and we have to work on your backhands four hours per day for a week, we'll do that. And with the left wing girl I was coaching, we did that. We worked with opening up her hip with how she put her feet on the backhand and we could work with that four hours of backhand per day for a week. And then we solved it. And then we came to the next tournament that she won, you know? <laughs> But it takes a lot of, of, and especially in a lot of places, like, I don't know if you heard the thing uh, that coaches live and die by their exercises. So if you come to me every week, like, you know, and, and you, you and a friend and you take, have me as a, or the four people in a group or whatever, oh, it has to be fun and it has to be varied and everything. No, we had like, I have like eight drills that I like, and then I modify them for what we need to do. But it's a lot of the same. That's the way it is. You know, I'm like an ultra runner. When I wanted to win the toughest race in Sweden, which is 246 kilometers, I ran a lot. I had a 12-day period before that when I would run 30 kilometers one day and do the gym and 60 kilometers the next day, and I would alternate that for 12 days straight. You know, and then I went out there and I ran for 40 minutes and 32 minutes and 40 hours and 32 minutes, and I crushed everyone and I won. But it wasn't, was it fun? No, but it was satisfying, you know, and you have to look for that. They're not like, oh, no, we had such fun drills and, you know, it's, no. So they have to understand that it's tough, but also if you do it, you, you, give you, you, you put yourself in a position to win. And that's ultimately what we want is to win. I think that's maybe what you're not seeing in, in the, the Swedish culture is a little bit, if we go back to that, that it's, it's, a, it's not, people are afraid to be so blunt because like sports are about winning. Like you, you can dress it up the way you want. I mean, like if you have a recreational hobby as, and it's a sport, that's different. Like you enjoy it socially, but if you're a, professional tennis player or football player or whatever it's about performing you know and and that requires hard physical work and mental work right so this is like to bring the best out of you and that's i i guess why you why you hire a coach uh, but to leave that topic a little bit um, i'm curious now like you have people on the tour and you see lots of different types of coaching situations you have players that want to hire like a, a kind of a fancy team like boris becker as having Luthi for holger rune then he you know they quit after two weeks and he goes back to Patrick Moratoglu, which is also kind of a famous influencer coach. And then you have players like Emma Raducanu, who can't seem to find a coach that she likes for more than two months or something. Um, what are some like feelings you have around these types of situations? Or, or are there kind of coaching and player relationships you really look up to and you like uh, what, that you see on the top levels? Well, I think that when you hire someone... Um, like when, I mean, even Djokovic, he, he hired Todd Martin, I think was the first one to help with the serve or something. Mm -hmm. He had mm -hmm. Becker, um, you know, you've seen all these, you know, they hire top guys. Usually that's what I we were speaking about before. They, when you get up there, um, the, the margins are so small. So you're trying to find that last, you know, piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I think that's why they do it. That's why they hire someone and then they try this and they try that. And they, they try, they, they think that they're going to find like some magic, for those last percentages because Holger Rune is so close. I mean, he's not that far away from the top guys. So he's trying to find that last percentage, I think. And it's not easy because you don't know who's going to, you know, what's going to work out well for you. Um, even though I'm, I'm sure Boris Becker knows a lot about tennis, but, you know, it, it's not easy. But that's why I think they do it. But also, on the, if you see on the other hand of it, um, you see a lot of players that should have let go of their coach a long time ago. You know, so I, I was speaking to a Greek player and I said, like, this is a year ago. But I've said this many times. Why is not Maria Sakkari winning a, a Grand Slam? And she should have done that, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, and she didn't. And in my opinion, she is playing like she lost. She was always playing like she lost a bet against someone. And now she's not allowed to use tactics. She's just hitting balls, which is to me insane. And I spoke to a Greek girl and she said, well, oh, well, you know, Thomas, she's doing pretty good. Like, yeah, but she should go for being number one and she should switch coaches. And once she does, she will have, she will, she will do good. And what happened now? She went with David Witt, the Pegula's old coach, yep. and she went to the finals of, of Indian Wells, which is, I don't count Guadalajara because I was there and I saw the quarters and the semis in the final. It was a ridiculous tournament, to be fair, with you know, strength-wise. And that's why they lost their, their status to be a 500 next year because they, it was so weak. And I mean, she beat, not, not against them, but she beat Sarango in the, in the quarters. It was like 100-something, 80. She beat Garcia, who had like the worst period of her life and, you know, like there and and Zachary always had an easy time with her. And then she got Dolhide, 
whom I like and I love their coach, but uh, she's 144 in the finals. So this, I would say, is her by far best, you know, because now she played a bit smarter. You know, like something happened. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, I can use tactics again. Like the bet is over. So, so this, I think, also happens. It goes both, goes both ways. It goes both ways. And I think many times you see, okay, I did it. I had this coach or I, I made it this far. Why should I make a change now? Come on. You get a new coach sometimes. Some, someone does. And they go, yeah, I want, to, want you to make this change, whatever it is. Jones, like, you know, let me make this change on your forehand. And he goes, well, you know, I made it to this ranking. Are you sh like, they don't really know, even though they hired you. And this is on every level um, like this. And, and some people, and this baffles me, like you're 600 in the world and you're, you know, 650, and you're 27 years old. And so let's do this because, you know, you can maximum, let's say you can maximum make like three backhands in a row. Maybe we should do this and it's solid. I don't want to make that change because they think that 650 is pretty good. It's like, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, 650, you know, I've run a 257 marathon, uh, which means that I'm like better at marathon running compared to what you are as a tennis player. <laughs> and I'm not a pro. So maybe, you know, we should look at it. I'm not taking away from, you know, that you, that you're playing tennis and you're trying to do things, but come on, you should be looking at what, what the hell should I be doing? I'm pushing 30 and I'm 700, you know, I should be, so it, I don't know. I don't understand. I think the, the players that become good are the ones not making extremely good choices, but not doing dumb things. People do things like, and there are so many things that you wouldn't believe. When I write a book, you will hear things that, I mean, you won't believe the things that you hear from players. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And that's why they're not better than they are. And you say, oh, this girl has a potential. And you start talking to them. And you're just like, because I, I sometimes see like, boy, this girl has everything, but she cannot win matches. And you go and talk to, and you, you know, you get to hear things and then you realize, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a strange world. I don't know if it's, if you know, but I don't know if it's like, do crazy people start playing tennis or do they become crazy because of tennis? <laughs> it's a good question. Know, but... <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's there are many crazy things, many strange things. And I like logics, but there, there, there are so many times there's like, you cannot believe the things that happen. I think tennis can drive you crazy, but I also think like it's a solo sport that requires um, it's it's kind of a strange setup for many. I think like and you, you, a lot of tennis players that are go pro, they are raised like you know in a box with their parents only. They don't have so many external influences, and uh, it's all about building their ego. And then they when they come out in the real world and have to listen to coaches and stuff, they can't listen to coaches because they they think maybe that, that they have a really big ego or. Uh, they think like, oh, the way my father taught me is the only way to do it, my forehand or my my backhand. But I, I think you have to have a very critical thinking, you know, when you when you are in any profession. And I think sometimes I think the the way people are raised within the tennis world is very boxy, and then you don't have open yeah. my, an open mind to accept that, you know, I'm if you are six fifty, you're not gonna you're not making any money. So either you change or you quit, right? Like this is the only, like there's two things. You have to change something to win matches or yeah. you quit. That Those are the only two options. Like you can't be 650 for 10 years because you're not making, you're losing money every year. So it's, this is, if, yeah. if, if tennis is a business, which which it is, if you're a pro, you have to look at it as like a company. Like, oh, I'm selling burgers or I'm doing something. Am I making money? What, what What's the situation? No, I'm not, I'm not winning matches. Why? Mm -hmm. And then you try to solve it. It's like bringing in a CEO, like a coach. Okay, you were the CEO of my tennis career. Uh, if you don't bring the results, I fire you, but I will listen to you while you're here, right? That's the mindset. It has That's to the way it should be. But but you know what? There's an interesting thing. I was thinking about that on my on my run this morning is that when I was playing, I'm born 76, as mine is Norman. We're the same age. Uh, and, and we, so I'm 47 years old. And when I was playing college, I was a pusher. Uh, the longest rally, because what I did was I was just playing moon balls. You know, I was crap. I started when I was 14. I was a bad player. I had, you know, I, the technique was totally homemade. And so I figured I had to win because the coach was like, Thomas, you're playing fifth or sixth singles, you have to win. So I was just pushing. I was playing like 30 meters high balls like this. And then I started to do something to not lose focus and was I counted how many times we could hit the ball over the net. And then when we sat down, I would write it down to see what the record was. And the longest rally I ever had was over 45 minutes, one rally, 767 times over the net in a match, in a college match. And the thing is, you couldn't do that now because people would just, you know, let it bounce and then just hit an overhead and kill you. But at that time, I could kind of run it down. When I played someone who was a lot better than I was, I lost six zero six zero, like six zero six zero. They were double bagel, and this was easy for me because I couldn't see the like you, you couldn't see the results in the same way. Internet was coming and everything, but it wasn't as easy to see results. 
So you could think that you, oh, maybe I'm close to them, you know, because this guy beat that guy and he took a set from him and he's pretty good. And, but then when you came up there and you played someone who was like 500 in the world and they would beat you 6 0 6 0. So you understood that, okay, I'm too far away. I'm never going to be a good player. But the thing then was that if you were really good and I wasn't that good, you would beat me 6 0 6 0. Whereas today, with the same difference, you would beat me. Six three six six four, maybe two breaks in the first set and one break in the second set, but it was as easy as six zero six zero then. But the six zero six zero then might have been a longer match time wise than the three and four today, because then you know they couldn't just kill the ball like they 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 moved you side to side, they wore you down, and the first three games you know they could be like thirty five minutes, and then yes you know you got more tired in the last games were but, and so you back then it was like yeah I can kind of grind but it's like no. But now, anyone can hit a shot as Carlos Alcaraz or Sinner. Anyone can. Maybe we can't hit as hard of the serve or whatever, but basically we can hit the same shot as they can with the technology, with the balls, with their surface. The only thing is they can do it all the time. And even if you're a great player, you know, if you're Slatan Ibrahimovic or Ronaldo or someone, and you have three, three opportunities in a match, in a football match, you're completely free with the, with the goalie, and you make one and you miss two, you're still a star if you win 1-0. But if you're a tennis player and you make one ace and two double falls all the time, you're never going to hold serve. You're never going to win a match. So in tennis, you have to deliver all the time. You have to deliver over time and you have to win more points than you lose. So you have to find reproducible weapons. So people tend to think, and this goes back to what you said. I'm sorry if I'm babbling too much, but it's like you said, okay, I'm not making money. I should quit this. But they think, okay, I'm 700, but I do have a nice serve there and I do my lefty spin or I have this boom you know, the, 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 the tea that I like. And, you know, this is as good as Sabalenka's. So, you know, once I get, you know, once I start making these, I'm going to go like swoosh and I'm going to be like a rocket coming up. The only thing is you're never going to, it's not like all of a sudden you're just hitting, you know, smacking the ball and all of a sudden it's going to start going in. That never happened. I mean, I can guarantee you that it wasn't like Sabalenka was hitting as hard as she is now when she was 12, but everything went out. And then at some point, everything started going in. I mean, she was, you know, hitting harder and harder, practicing more and more, and then she developed. But that's what people think. That's my, my take on it. And that's why they think, well, you know, once everything, you know, clicks, I'll be out there. And sometimes it happens. The only thing is, I mean, I can see the players in a 15K, for instance, and I can see, okay, that girl, she could actually, you know, like she has that kind of game. Those other 31 in the draw, doesn't matter what we do. They're not going to be a top 100 player ever. You know, you, you can see that this is this is not going to happen. So that one maybe or two maybe might be able to do it if everything clicks, the others know. So when one of those two make it, all the others that never had a chance, they see, well, listen, she made it, so maybe I can. That's why they go on year after year losing money because they think that maybe one day. But then you come to them and you and they hire you as their coach, and I've talked to many coaches about this, they don't really want to make the changes. You know, I'm like... and. and what do you think? This is what Einstein said, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of an idiot, is what he said. And for me, this is true. I mean, they just don't want to change it. But that's why they do it, I think, because they think that one day, oh, it's going to fall into place. It's like, no. <laughs> how, how tough it is, is it, uh, would you say, for a player to make a technical change? Let's say they're a pro, they are 25 years old, 26 years old. And uh, they, you, you tell them like, hey, you know, you're spraying on the forehand or something. Something technical needs to change on the serve, uh, and they're reluctant. You know, is it because it's so difficult to do it? Is it because they worry about losing, you know, maybe a few matches and losing hurts, and they start doubting the the process? Uh, what, what what would you say about this? I, I think it's it's completely individual how easy it is. But I think the the the, the toughest part, and this is when I had I had a Latvian girl. She came to me. She was slicing all her forehands. And it's funny, if you go back to like the first tournaments when we started working together, she was playing UTR. So I guess you can see the videos uh, still on YouTube at that time. And they're there. So people can go watch them and she was slicing forehands. But because she had been going over more and more to a close grip and she had this, you know, Western kind of super Western. And the coach she had what, during the lockdown in 2020 in Dubai uh, with her boyfriend's family there, he tried to help her open it up. But she was spreading all over Spain when we started, you know, she was just spraying balls. And that's the hardest part to go from a close grip to open it up. That's usually the toughest part. That's for people. But most, if you have a coach who knows what they're doing and, and you, you're kind of making a change, um, 
is to have patience and to believe in it. Like you said, like if you don't believe in it, it doesn't matter because the coach is right. That's why I like the thing when I'm helping people, you know, put on muscle or, you know, run a marathon or lose weight or whatever. They just have to do what I say and they're going to make it. <laughs> but in tennis, it's not like that because, you know, if, if I tell you, if you want to gain 10 kilos of muscle mass, if you just do what I say, it doesn't matter if you believe in it, you're still going to gain <laughs> if you do what I say. But in tennis, you know, if you don't believe in it, you're, you're, it's not going to work. So I think it's a combination of those things. But I think it's not only that. It's like you can tell someone, okay, listen, you're doing this. You're, you, I had one girl I coach, and I said, I can see your backhand. You're taking like off the bounce. You're taking as like a half volley all the time. And your record in the match, when they put everything to your backhand, is three in a row. That's your record. You know? And in practice, you can make like five on cross courts to make it on half court without the alley. Five. If we wait for the ball a little bit, you step back a little bit and you hit it with some more shape on it, you can hit it harder with more spin and it's going to be a better shot. Boom, 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 20 times in a row. Boom, 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 good. Down the line, boom, boom. Really nice. Ah, oh, but I don't feel, I think that I want to do it the way I did it. What are you going to say? And then you come to the match. It's like after the match, and you let them come down. You go, listen, you know, you were spreading your backhands. Maybe we should do this instead. Oh, we haven't trained that, so I couldn't change. No, 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 but maybe, you know, this was a sign. No, but, you know, you know, this feels good. And, you know, when this falls into place, it's going to be good. And, you know, it's, it's those kind of things. And as you said, you would think, for me at least, if I hire a coach, I, will, I would see in the first, like, weeks if he has a, if, if he or she has a, some kind of philosophy that I don't agree with, I would just quit. But they kind of keep you, you know? And it's like you're doing six months together, and it's like they don't really listen. Like, why would you want to hire someone and then not make any changes? Um, but that's the way it is. I think a lot of it is, is uh, confidence overall, and a lot of it, as I said, is the, the social things. They want to do this and that, and they want to go to a wedding, they want to go to a party, all this shit. And it comes, this goes for coaches also. They miss a final match in a in a in a twenty five k because it's midsummer. Like, I mean, how how are you still? Uh, like, I don't even know what to say. Or someone said, "Oh no, well, why isn't he here?" Well, he had a wedding. Like, you know, they look at me like, "Oh, he had a wedding." Like that should, you know, it, that should make it all right. Like, I've never been to a wedding in my life. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't care about that. I want to win, and if there's a bigger chance of me winning when I'm there, I'm gonna be there. So I think it goes for both coaches and players. Actually, How do you? I, I agree. I agree. How do you um, deal with like losses? Like, let's say tough losses. Like, how would your approach be? I, I understand that it's personal, depending on the player, but that's a tough situation for a tennis player. Like, they're losing the match. Could be seven six in the tie break, like in the final set, or some something tough. And maybe it's the third loss in a row, uh, or in qualis, or whatever. Like, what would be like your uh, thinking around that to deal with that situation to get them to a positive uh, thinking again? Well, you know, I, I think that the most the most important thing is this because just because you know I think that winning is good, losing is bad. You have to understand that, and, and they do that. But you said, listen, we want to win. So now you've had these four last tournaments. You lost in first or second round of qualifiers. Let's say, why do you lose? So I I do the stats during the match. I said, listen, when this happens, you lose points. When this happens, you win points. I was helping one girl. I can give you an example. So uh, Timo Feva who is good now. She's like 100 now, right? Yeah. Um, and she was she was playing. She was at this time like 1, 240. And last summer, she was a lucky loser in uh, in Buda, Budapest, no? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah, the WTA. She was a lucky loser and she won the tournament, right? Some weeks before that, I was helping one girl, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, I was helping her because she was going to play Timo Feva in the German league. I think it was German. It was, at least it was league. And she was saying to me like she couldn't return she was returning horribly so i went through like eight of her matches and i i, I did the stats of all those matches and i told her listen her coach before had told her to return to the middle and that's that's a generic good piece of advice because when you return to the middle fast a lot of girls are a little bit slower with the split step after the serve than the guys are so it's a really good thing to do it can be a good thing to do but obviously there's no one size fits all so i told her listen we we, we divide the, the court by four quarters you know um, side to side so listen when you hit your first serve to this spot a little bit over to the back and side and right-handed and then you hit the second shot to that same place you win i think it was like 17 percent of the points when you're returning when you hit the first serve to the same spot but you hit the next the next shot either far out to one side or far out to the other side 
you win like 44% of the points, you know? So why don't do that all the time? Yes, don't go back. You go the first shot right to her and then the next one to the sides. And so she's playing and she's herself ranked much lower. And she called me up and she was like, so happy about the match. And she's like, I lost. I was like, okay, well, um, uh, six, three, seven, five. But out of the eight games that I won, seven, I couldn't serve for shit. But seven of those games were return games. It was amazing. I hit the ball there and I hit to the sides and I won so much. And I broke her seven times. And this girl, like, couple, like a month later, she wins the WTA tournament. So you have to look at it that way and see. And it's if you really chart everything that I do and I, and I go back to when I start working with someone, I start looking at their matches. There's so much on YouTube. You look at it. You look at all the patterns. Uh, and so you see, listen, when you play here and then there, you, you win this much. And there you, you win this much. I had one girl that I said, listen, you have six shots. You have four on down the line, four on cross court, four on inside in, four on inside out, back and cross, back and down the line, right? When you go for the winner on either of those, when you're on top of the line or maybe a little bit on the baseline and you really uh, you step in and you go for a winner, the worst shot was the back and down the line, which she loved to hit. For every winner you have there, you have 3.89 mistakes. When you go inside out, for every mistake, you have 6.76 winners. Do you think you should just go for inside out all the time and just put the back and back in? And she did. And she's ranked 11.30 and she wins a 25K UTR with like 1890, a 562 rank, a 406 and a 306. Because she did that, you know? So you look at it that way. And when she was, for instance, when she was going to play the 306 girl, who is now ranked 250, she cannot hit a winner forehand down the line to save her life. But she has an amazing cross court. So my player was standing over at the cross court waiting for the ball. And she beats her. It was such a fight. They were playing for like three hours and she won 6-3 in the third. But she was 11-32 and she beat at 306. And it wasn't only one match. It was all those four matches against highly ranked compared to her. So this is the way to look at it. It's not rocket science, but you have to do this. Whether you're winning or losing, you should always be looking at where are my winning points and where am I bleeding? You know, you stop the bleeding and then you try to go where you win points. And if you do that and you, you have your player look at tennis like a computer game, you know, like when we were kids and we play Super Mario Brothers and you see that mushroom kills me every time when you were little on level five, four. Well, then you have to do something different the next time. And then when you, okay, I figured out how to do it. Okay, then there's a new obstacle further ahead. And then eventually at some point you, you, you finish the game. You should look at it like this, you know, and, and take the emotion out of it a bit and look at it, you know, just from facts and just from stats. This is what's happening. When you do this, this happens. And sometimes, you know, like, okay, you're, you're foreign cross court. You have to be able to get it to open up the court more because you're, you're getting it, you know, you have to hit it so it easily sets, so it bounces and then goes over the, the, the singles line, not so it bounces and then goes over the baseline. You've got to get that angle. And we cannot get the angle. And when you're putting it there, you know, you're at a disadvantage. So it can be something that we have to practice. And then we go out and we practice that forehand and we drill it. We drill it for four hours per day for a week if we need to with high intensity, you know, and, you know, I just to monitor that your arm doesn't fall off. Then we have to do some backhands, but basically, and then next time you're playing, you can use that shot. And, and this is how you should look at it. And I don't see this happening. You know, and this is that this is at least how I do. Whether do you, you win or um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you um what do you think about like I mean you seem sound like a very data logical guy, right? So and now they're trying to bring in like the uh, IQ uh, in on the ATP. Uh there are many more like jobs or positions or professionals like as data analysts in tennis now these days, like companies that offer this service. Is it something you use? Is it something you write down yourself? How how important is data to you in as a coach in tennis? It depends what you mean by data, but obviously, you know, for me, it's only looking where do you win points? Where do you lose points? You know, and then when you have that and you can quite fast, especially when they're older, you know, okay, if they're 12, but when they're 20 plus, you can tell, okay, this, these are the patterns that I'm good at. So you want to play those patterns, but again, some players, you know, your pattern is going to, you just play into their strength and you have to change something. So you look a bit at the opponent, but you go from where your strengths are. Um, but I think also with data, it's very important that you know what data to use, you know, and, and what your player is good at. So if, if I'm a super grinder in college and you're my coach and you say, Hey, Thomas, this guy, he has a problem when you hit him that huge kick serve out and you, you, you know, you rush the net and you go serve and volley. And, you know, then I do that and I would not hold serve even once because I didn't have a huge kick serve and I couldn't volley, 
you know, to save my life. And so that, then it doesn't work, obviously. So you have to know your player and everything is individual. So. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it, it's just more talk about data in general. And I think sometimes yeah. there's over-reliance on data. I've heard that talked about with other coaches as well. Like there's, you know, because people want to have like three easy steps to win this match. It's like, okay, his yeah. his second serve is, is weak. You can attack it to the backhand or something. And it's, it's always very personal, right? So like you said, yeah. if the guy that is getting the advice doesn't have the shot that he needs to, to play according to the data, then he needs to find another solution, right? He cannot use a solution he doesn't have. That makes sense. No, and sometimes they, they see something online and they go like, oh, to beat this player, you have to do this. But someone can tell me like, oh, Thomas, this is how you beat you know, Djokovic. It doesn't matter if I know exactly how to beat him because I cannot do the things yeah. that are needed. Like you said, so you have to look at it. You have to have a coach who knows you and who's willing to do the, do the work, I think. But I don't see this because when I work with players, when I help them some with stats, uh, they are like, wow, I, you know, I, I never heard about anyone looking at this even before. And I don't know why. I don't know if they, I think a little bit like you don't have to. I mean, to be, to be honest, you know, I, I, I'm not going to name any names, but when I'm at the tournaments, you know, if you go to one of those classic, you go to Shaman Sheikh or Antalya or Monastir, Tunisia or, or Egypt or, or Turkey, and you go to those resort tournaments, you know, the coaches come and they, you know, they have breakfast. Many times they're not with your players. Sometimes they are. They go and then they, you know, they have a practice session maybe. They come to the court, then they leave, they part ways. And then, you know, maybe they see them at the gym a little bit. They have a match, you know, they have a cool down. They talk a little bit, that's it. And then they come and then, you know, they, yeah, they, they are there for the, this is the same thing all the time. I don't really see anyone doing this. And when I talk to the player, because first of all, you know, this was just what I felt. I didn't really know. So then I talked to some players that I was helping. They're like, no, but I've never heard anything like this. Like someone might've said to me, like that one girl, like, oh, I should, you know, hit your returns and down the middle. That's, you know, and try to, you know, play high to her back end. Like, that's where the the tactical stuff ends. And, I mean, like, this is not when you were 10 and one guy had a 10, you know, a 10 had a one-handed back end. It's like, play to his back end. No, I mean, this is professional tennis, even though with the women, this is why you see sometimes the results are big. And that's why you sometimes see the 6-1, 2-6, Because they don't, sometimes, you know, like, when if we are two women playing and my game adds up perfectly with yours, I could just beat you even though I'm not really better, you know, in overall than you are. But sometimes I kind of, it kind of just happens that I play my strength to your weakness. And then the second set, I don't do that and I'm killed. And then I kind of get back to it in the third. And sometimes you talk to them, they don't even know what happened, but they win. You know, I had one girl, she, she was, she won six, this is a long time ago. She won six zero one six six zero. And I asked, like, so what happened? And we had we had a deal together. Like, you cannot say, I don't know. You have to say something, you know, to get kind of some kind of talk going. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, she was thinking. She goes, like, well, the first set, she wasn't good. Then the second set, she was really good. And then the third set, she wasn't good anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing analysis. Like, but at least you said something, you know. But this is the way. And I think it's obviously easier when you're, you're looking at things from the side. But sometimes, even for me, like the girl I told you about, like the back and down the line, even though that was out of the six shots, what was her worst one? Sometimes it's like it's a good feeling when you hit that shot. Like someone, you know, I, I don't know if you golf. I have done a couple of times only, but when you go out and you hit that nice drive and yeah, and he just goes, it's a good feeling, right? And she had a good feeling when she hit it, but she had no clue that statistically this was the worst shot she could go for, you know. And so I think the emotion has to be taken. Like I said, it has to be taken out of it. And you can't just, uh, yeah, you, you can't let it be only going by emotion because you're not going to win in the long run. And once you're willing to just do what it takes, do the job, and then, you know, play smart, you can go really, really far. I think, like, there are a lot of girls that could go to, like, to be 300. Like, that is not at all. Right? But the question is, if I told you, if you're 26 years old and you're 700, and I said, listen, Juna Sina. If you do everything correct, you might be 300. Like if you put everything, you, you don't have a, you know, a partner, you don't have fun, you don't go out, you do nothing. You, you commit for five years, you're going to be 300. It's like, oh, I don't know, because <laughs> I'm still not going to make any money. I'm not going to be in the slams. I don't think it's worth it, you know? So it's, um, yeah, I think, but I think a lot of players, a lot more players could go to 300 than, than they think they can. And I think just that, Many players not willing to do it, and I I say that I've had two girls, so that's why also why I kept with with Sammy Staya for so long, 
was it because you know not because you know she was 21 and, and I'm, I'm 47 or 46 45 at the time so it's not like we had that much in common right it's not like well we had so much fun hanging out but she did what i said and she she agreed with the things i said and it was uh, the the only player i had before who was actually all in doing what i said was a girl that i had my first full-time job in 99 and she did also well so i had her like 99 to 2004 or something so if it's going to be every 17 years, I get someone <laughs> who is actually all in doing what I say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to cling to that as much as I can. I'm hoping it's not going to take 17 more years because I'm not getting younger. So, but that's, uh, yeah, I can go all in, you know, I, I go for a run. I have a coffee. That's it. I don't have to do anything else. I can go all in on tennis. I can be there for my player. I can go all in, but yeah, it's, it's tough. Most players, they say they want to be tennis players, but I think most of them just want to, they like the, the the thought of being a tennis player. They like going around, you know, they, they save one of those old badges from when they got to play 125 WTA five years ago on their, with their name on it. It's cute, you know, on their bag. And they, they like the idea of being a tennis player, but they're not doing anywhere close to what they need to do. And that's most players. Like the, 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 lack, of, the lack of work is, is stunning uh, in, in many cases. So do you think there's, um, is there a softer, do we raise softer people today or do you think this has always been the case that it's like up and down or, or, I mean, some people might, I've, you've heard that argument that like uh, life is too easy. I mean, not everywhere, of course, but it's like the, the new generations are pretty comfortable uh, from the start, many of them. And that could be argued like for the Swedish growing up in Sweden is easier than maybe growing up in Eastern Europe in many cases. Right. So you get a more of a fighting spirit from Eastern Europe than you get from a Swedish person, just as an example depending on own circumstances. But what, what do you think? There's a generational thing or, or cultural thing or something that, that breeds, brings champions, right? Well, I think so. And I think, I think that before, like when, when, when I was a junior and coming up and, you know, I think that um, there weren't that many players because it was, the opportunities are, are there more now. So there should be, you know, and, and obviously the, the quality is higher also. I mean, when I started out and the, for the women's, when it was at 10,000, I mean, it was in the main role, I would beat half the players then if I played right-handed, forehand, left-handed, forehand, I would basically beat half the players in the field. It was ridiculous. And now it's tough. You know, it's more competitive. Uh, but so the, the average level is higher, but the number of players, I think, you know, they have all the chances in the world, but they don't really, yeah, they're softer. They don't really want to take that. And But it's not like, you know, if you come to me and you say, because I have this thing, I, I help people lose weight you know and, and and get in shape and and my program is tough and they're doing it for almost four months and and uh, they go into it and some people they they wash out because they can't do it right but then they say oh no thomas this is too much for me i'm gonna quit and i said that's fine and the ones that do it they have amazing results because it's just it, it's it's basically fact this is what you do when you, you get results but i think in tennis you don't because you, you you want to become good you want to become a top 100 player if you're 542 in the world and you come to me and, and I say, let's do this. And it's tough. And you go, oh, but that's too much for me. You know, like, I don't want to do that. You're going to feel not only towards me, but towards yourself. Like, how can I be a tennis player? And I say that, you know, I don't want to do it because it's too tough. So instead they go, no, I don't really think I need that. I think I can do this instead. But the funny thing is over 26 years, uh, 26 years now working with competitive players, uh, competition players and, and performance players, I haven't even had once where we have a difference of opinion on what needs to be done and what they said that they wanted to do was higher intensity or like tougher than what I said, you know? So it's always like, well, you know, maybe we don't need four hours. And then and, and this classic, they go, well, you know, it's better to do two hours per day with great quality than four hours with so with like bad quality. I said, well, I have this Latvian girl. She did one hour of serve every morning, super focused, one hour, and then four hours of tennis, amazing quality. You know, you can't just say it and think by the logic that if you're doing four hours, the, the, the quality goes down. No, some players, they can do four hours per day with amazing quality. And it doesn't matter what you do with your two hours. If they are doing it perfectly for four hours, you, you're not going to, you're not going to beat them. You know, and also they become animals. Like she was an animal because when she came out, She'd been suffering on court every day, every day, every day, you know, like one rest day in two weeks. And, you know, sometimes not even that. And, and she comes out and she's a beast, you know, 
and then they come and you know they're a bit soft and like this and i could just tell like this is you know you could see sometimes in the end of the match i remember one time she was down like five three in the third and she played the high ranked you know like 130 player and she was down five three and i was on on text with the coach back in the club i was in mexico and she comes out and she she's down five three and she holds serve for five four and they sit down and he texts me oh i see it's five four now she's down five three. do you think she can turn it around and actually, when I got that text from him, they were standing up and starting to walk out to the baselines. And I could see, I saw on her face, and I was like, she's won. I'll give you my apartment if she doesn't win this match. I told him, she's going to win this. It's over. Bam, 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 three games, seven, five. And she was just, she just murdered the other. Like, it was just by the, you know, she was just a, an animal. She was just going to win. You could just tell, you know, there was beast mode. And this is something that you get, like, going back to what you said about the mental versus the, 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 the physical, you get so much, you know, mental strength from being physically strong. You know, for me, when I know now, you know, you can tell me, hey, Thomas, you know, when I'm in, in Spain, you have a day off, you want to run 52 kilometers to Alicante to have a Starbucks? I say, sure. It's a nice day, you know? Oh, it's 38 degrees. There's some oh, it's no problem. Let's have, you know, a Coke on half ways. It's no problem. Let's do 52K. I'm not going to feel it tomorrow. You know, you want to go 3.30 marathon, it's five minute K pace, no problem. It's a good feeling. You know, to know that you can do all these things without a problem. And and I think this is the most important thing. But most players, they don't want to get to that. They don't. It's it's tough. Where, where is your uh, running interest uh, coming from? It's like you've always been a passion to push yourself to the max. Like uh, you've always been like a natural runner. Like you, you're looking for the, the runner's high or the mental peace that running brings. No, no, I, I didn't like running. I hated running. I was like, who runs? Like, this is idiotic. Like, what would you run if there's not a ball, right? We play floorball in Sweden or we play yeah. football, soccer, or tennis or something. But my, my mom died in 20, 2010. Uh, she was only 59 years old. And then 28th of April, she died. And the 1st of May was before Jacob, uh, that you know, that he came to my club. So I didn't really have that top player at, at the time to work individual with. I was just sitting in a locker room, like, you know, like I was feeling down over the whole situation that she died oh, and everything yeah. of, of cancer. And so I just went out and ran 15K. And uh, I couldn't walk the day after. I was dead, but I was like, this is cool. I'm going to do this. And then since then, I've just been doing marathons and ultra marathons and like, uh, you know, ran through Sweden twice from top, like it's a 52 K per day for 40 days. And I ran from North to South and South to North. And I like to do these kind of things. And I go for a marathon sometimes and I, I like it. Yeah. Yes. You know, I don't know. It's runner's high, I guess, or it's a good time for me to think and let my, my, my mouth, uh, rest from all my talking so i don't know i just like to to do things and i like to push myself and i've done long races so it's the 500 kilometers you know i've had like my kidneys shut down i've uh, had heat stroke i've fainted thrown up and uh I, I think it's cool to push myself i feel cool when i you know it feels good to know that i can push myself to the limit whereas everything shuts down and i don't think that tennis players need to do that but they they have to at least come close to you know at least i think once per week you should have a session where you have to lay down when you're down down you know like when you go for a crossfit thing or whatever yeah, yeah. and you've pushed yourself so hard so you have to lay there for 10 minutes before you can even get up and i don't see that much and as maybe it's a generational thing but sometimes you have to really push yourself and some players like the laughing girl i had i mean kudos to her she worked that hard all the time every day and she i, I bet she still does and she's like she beat at 101 now she's 110 She's an amazing player because she has that mentality. And uh, I don't have a, in my mind, which is the only mind that I really, really care about, obviously, uh, I, I think people look way too much what other people think. I think they should be happy with, you know, decide this is what I want to accomplish. If I accomplish that, I'm happy with it. Don't look from the outside. Look for something that you want to do and then be happy if you, you know, and I'm always happy if I make the result. And I have no doubt in my mind that if I get a player, who is really committed, I will get them to where they need to be. I always win something. And so, you know, it will reach goals with everything. And, but I also push and I know that it's tough. And I know that sometimes we have to quit at some point because it becomes too tough, you know, but I'm not going to change that. And so like right now, either I have, I'm giving myself a couple more months to find someone that I really want to coach and something that I'm really 100% inspired by and the circumstances are good. And if I don't find that, I'm going to quit. I'm going to take a year off. Yeah. I'm just going to travel, travel the world, uh, do something, some cool project. You have to take a year off and like step back from it. 
you know, I will watch it and do stuff, but I just, I just think that, you know, I've been on all levels now from, you know, tennis, like Swedish championships, you know, I have Nordic champion. Uh, I've been to the tennis group 12s, 14, 16, ITF 18s, futures, all the levels up to masters 1000. And I coach on all the levels and it, it's been going well. I mean, I, I, I don't really know what I have to prove to myself, but anymore, I don't, you know, but it will be fun to have someone who really wants to go, you know, like who's yep. all in again. I mean, that's obviously the greatest thing to have. But also, if you have that, you have to also know what to do with them, you know, because just pushing someone is not hard. Obviously, you know, you, no. just, I, I, you know, you could probably be my fitness coach and you could have me dead by 10, 10 minutes if you push me enough. <laughs> but I don't know how, how productive it will be if you don't know what you're doing. So you, there's obviously that aspect that you have to know what you're doing. But but yeah, I think that's the main thing that they don't want to they don't want to they don't want to scrap things in their life that they like. You know, they don't want to pay that price because you don't know. If you, if you go Swedish university and you get good grades, you know that you will get a job, you know? And you know yeah. kind of what level at least you will get. Okay, I'll get that money and oh, it's gonna be good. With tennis, you know nothing, you know? <laughs> so I think that's why people don't really wanna, maybe, I don't know, they don't really wanna go for it. But in my book, you know, I'd rather quit tennis one day and feel like I left it all on the court than having some doubts like what could I, I have done, you know, if I, if I <laughs> so. Always, 100% agree. Mm. I know you have a meeting now, so I'm, I'm not going to keep you, uh, but it, you're like the Swedish David Goggins, so I, I, I do like that. <laughs> I like the attitude. It's, it's similar to what I think usually. So uh, it's been really good talking to you, and uh, when you want to come on again uh, to talk about your new developments, if you find a player or whatever, we do that. So uh, it's been great. Yeah, I'll, I'll invite you when I'm in the in, in uh, Grand Slams with a player. I'll invite you to the box there. That would be cool, yeah. fly, I'll fly you in. And so, uh, yeah, you can give some help us a little bit with, with rackets and strengths and stuff. I know that yeah. you're a pro. So, yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. And when I'm down in Marbella, I'll, I'll look you up and we can have a run or a, or a tennis hour or something. I'm up, yeah, I'm up for you there. I like running as well. Uh, my knees are a little bit so-so, but I used to run marathons as well and, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm a big into running. That's cool. why I asked, you know. Yeah, when I'm past Marbella, we'll do both. It'll yeah. be cool. Awesome, man. Well, uh, good luck with your meeting and uh, nice talking to you and have a nice day, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good one.